Today I want to share with you a depression era tuna pie recipe with a cottage cheese biscuit topping. And I have to share with you that these biscuits are so easy to make and they're not drop biscuits, but you don't roll the dough out either. You're gonna be so impressed with how clever this idea is. Hi, sweet friends. I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest, where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning how to be a modern pioneer in the kitchen, consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to click on the little notification bell below. That'll let you know every time I upload a new video. As always, I just want to mention that if at any time you want to jump ahead, be sure to check the timestamps in the description underneath this video, and I'll also put the timestamps in the pinned comment. And I'll also have a link that'll take you over to my website where you can read the recipe online or you can print it out. Well, the other day when my husband and I were out and about looking at books at a used bookstore, I came across some very old books, not only from the Great Depression, but even before that. But the ones about the Depression were the most interesting to me because we're all looking for budget-friendly recipes these days. And the recipe that really caught my eye was one for something that was called a tuna pie. This tuna pie is so interesting and it sounds really delicious, because it's the cross between a tuna noodle casserole and a chicken pot pie. You make it in a 9 by 13 casserole dish, so this is sort of the perfect type thing to kind of feed a crowd or bring to a church supper, anything like that, or just to feed a hungry family. Now let's go over the ingredients, but if you're used to reading recipes from the Depression or before that, you'll often note that they're not as specific uh, frequently as the modern day recipes we're used to reading. So sometimes you kind of just gotta, kind of, guess I would say, just kind of go with it and just do the best that you can. So that's basically what I've done here. The recipe calls for two potatoes peeled and cut up in chunks, and that's exactly what I've done here. I used potato, I just kind of used a medium-sized potato. I used a Yukon Gold, I peeled it, and I just cut it into pieces, maybe about one inch or so. I, it was not an exact science by any stretch of the imagination. And then it called for one onion, no specification. I just used a yellow onion. It was about a medium-sized yellow onion. And then it called for some celery. So I just chopped up one stalk of celery. Now the recipe said just to simmer a potato, your cut up potato, your onion, and your celery together until just barely tender. We don't want this to become mushy or anything like that. And it said with enough water to cover. So you're not having to saute this uh, in any type of fat, butter, oil, nothing like that. That kind of comes a little later. And then we put the celery in here and then I'm gonna go get some more water because it says enough water to cover. And I just had my potatoes soaking in the water so they wouldn't brown. And it said just enough water to cover. So I'll go get some more water. And I just wanna mention before I do that, save your potato skins after you peel your potatoes and just simmer them in a little water, then save that water and when it's cool, you can use that to feed your sourdough starter if you keep a sourdough starter. Uh, the uh, sourdough starters love the potato water because it's rich in starch and the yeast will gobble that up quickly. So I added more water to cover and I put this on high. I'm gonna bring this up to a boil and then immediately kind of just turn it down to a low simmer and then monitor it to see once things are, like they said, just slightly tender. We want everything a little undercooked because we'll be baking it in the oven. Once this has a chance to simmer, then we've got to add in a couple of more cups of vegetables. And again, there was no specification. It just said two cups uh, additional vegetables. So what I did, I made this really easy and I'm just gonna add two cups of frozen mixed vegetables. I didn't really have anything in my crisper uh, that was getting ready. Often recipes like this, if they're getting a little close to their prime, I kind of like to get them out of the crisper and put them in some sort of soup or casserole, but I didn't really have anything uh, today. So I thought I'd go with frozen vegetables. So I just got these out of my freezer and I thought they would work great, especially since they kind of have a chicken pot pie appearance to them in a way. 
And talking about what I keep in the freezer, if you are looking for how to stock a traditional four corners pantry, as I say, your working pantry, your fridge, your freezer, and your extended pantry, I'll be sure to put a link in the description underneath this video, as well as in the pinned comment. I know it's some, for some of you, it's easier to access the pinned comment, uh, where you can go over to my website and download uh, my 36 page. You could download it, you could print it out, but it's 36 pages long, but you could at least download it uh, to your phone and have that as a guide to help you when you go grocery shopping so that you start, especially if you're at the beginning of your journey uh, to creating a traditional foods kitchen, that that shopping guide or that pantry list can really help you and guide you as to what are the types of foods you should be looking to add to your Four Corners Pantry. So I'll be sure to put that link below. Now, certainly the star of the show of a tuna pie is going to be the tuna. Now, I normally buy the darker tuna because it's less expensive. But when I was at my grocery store, they had this albacore tuna and this central market is like a brand, uh, a store brand of H-E-B. And the, for those of you who live in Central Texas, you know, uh, I like shopping at H-E-B, the grocery store. Uh, but they had this and it had an in-store coupon and so it was a little less expensive than what I usually buy. And that's often like I talk about, uh, you know, I'm not brand loyal, I'm not even really variety loyal. I look and see what's on sale, what do I have a coupon for, what is there a store coupon for? And so they had a store coupon for this. And so this is the solid white albacore tuna. So I think this is gonna be pretty nice because I, I usually use, not the dark, they call it chunk light, I think. Um, and I'm fine with that. But since this actually turned out to be less expensive, I decided to get this one. And this doesn't have salt. So I'm probably gonna add a little extra salt to the overall recipe, which when we get to that, we can, we can talk about that. But the thing that I wanna mention is the recipe says a can of tuna. And so there isn't, wasn't really any specification as to uh, what size of can of tuna. And so I just did a little research and I realized that back during the Depression, during the Great Depression of the 1930s here in the United States, that a can of tuna could be maybe somewhere between seven ounces and maybe almost close to 10 ounces. So I, what I did was these were five ounces, so I just bought two five ounce cans. So I'm using a total of 10 ounces, but know that you do have some flexibility. So if you have a little larger can of tuna, that may be just enough. Oh, and one thing I wanna mention, I already shared with you about the potato peels. As you peel your onion and dice it up, save your onion skins. Those are loaded with nutrition, just like the onion and be sure to put those in your scrap bag, your vegetable scrap bag that you save for when you make bone broth. We have to be as thrifty as possible today given the rising grocery prices. So try to save as much as you can, try to save every scrap you can and find a way to use it. Now the rest of the ingredients that you're going to need to make the filling, we'll get to the biscuits in a minute, but you're going to need some milk, uh, a cup of milk, I just did, again, it was no specification, I just have whole milk here, and you're gonna need four tablespoons of butter. They also mention lard, so that's an option because especially during the Depression, butter may not have always been plentiful, it may have been expensive, but a lot of people did have lard or bacon grease, things like that. Uh, but I've got, what I've got here is four tablespoons of butter because I realize a lot of people may not have lard, but I want to mention that if you are able to get pork fat, I have a video where I show you how to render it to make your own lard, and it's very easy to do. So I'll be sure to link to that video. Uh, but other than that, then you're going to need four tablespoons of all purpose flour and then just some salt and pepper. And that's how we're going to make the filling. Now, we are going to also be using, and I think this was part of the thriftiness of this Depression Era recipe, we are going to be using the cooking liquid to give us enough liquid that we need to sort of make that cream sauce that all of this is going to be in. Uh, they only, they start in the recipe with just one cup of milk. Certainly, if milk is plentiful for you, 
and you want to have, sorry if that's clicking as it's heating up, if you want to do this with all milk, you certainly can. But I'm going to kind of follow this recipe as close as possible, and I'm going to supplement the milk with the cooking liquid. Well, I use the point of my knife to test one of the potatoes, and it's just barely tender. It had a little, the knife went in, but it had a little bit of resistance, so that's perfect. So the next step is to add in our other vegetables, whatever we're using. Well, I just gave this about another minute, and then it says to drain everything, but to reserve the liquid. Alrighty, so here we go. I've got a colander over a big bowl. The next thing we need to do is to make this cream sauce. And this is what I really like about this recipe. They're not going to use a condensed canned soup. They're just making an old fashioned roux and then adding some liquid to it to make the cream sauce. And this is actually very easy to do. And I think as more people learn how to do this and know that you, you're basically controlling the ingredients and you're not getting all the chemicals that are in canned soup, more and more people are gonna just start making these homemade and not relying on those condensed soups, like you know, cream of mushroom, cream of celery, so on and so forth, because they're often laden with a lot of chemicals and preservatives. And I don't think those are things we want in our traditional foods kitchen. So, but in any event, I'm gonna go ahead and put my four tablespoons of butter into my frying pan and I'm going to get that melting and as that melts I'm going to go ahead and sprinkle in my uh, all-purpose flour. I've also got four tablespoons of that and that's that's generally the ratio for these kind of sauces. It's a one-to-one uh, -one relationship between the flour and the butter and then half that in terms of the liquid. So for example if you're using four tablespoons of butter and four tablespoons of flour, you're gonna use about two cups of liquid. And that'll, that'll make you know, a pretty, pretty nice, pretty thick uh, sauce. And the recipe talks about if you need to add more liquid, you know, depending on the consistency, you can certainly do that. But that's the general rule. So we've got four, four, and then we're gonna have two. We're gonna use, I've got the vegetables straining over here and we're gonna use some of that vegetable liquid to give us the two cups of liquid that we need. Alrighty, well, this is melting nicely. Let me go ahead and sprinkle in this flour. Now, a really good way to do this so that you don't get any lumps is to get a whisk and just start whisking it all together. And so that's what I'm gonna do. This is a nonstick pan. Uh, I love this pan. I don't know if any of you use these scan pans. They're really great. And they are like a kind of a healthy uh, nonstick. And they're very easy to work with and very easy to clean. Uh, but certainly you can use any kind of saucepan you have. But I'm going to get a one of those um, silicone whisks. And we'll start whisking in our flour and our butter to make our, our the base for our cream sauce. And all you do is just whisk the flour and the butter together. It takes about two minutes. You're just looking to kind of cook the raw flour taste out of the flour. And we are only going to do this for like two minutes. That'll be plenty. Uh, if you were making a maybe a chicken gravy, this is the same way you would make gravy. You might uh, let it go a little longer and take on a little bit of a golden color and then add your, your chicken bone broth or your chicken broth. But this is so easy to do. If you've never tried it before, I really hope that you'll experiment and see how easy it is to make these type of things. Alrighty, well, that is coming along beautifully. I'm just gonna leave that for a minute. And now what we need to do is ladle in to our milk. And again, you can use two cups of milk if you've got plenty of milk. But we're gonna keep this extra thrifty and we're going to ladle in some of this vegetable broth, uh, more or less vegetable broth, uh, into our cup to get two cups of liquid. So I think I'm about to get to two cups. Now we will have some extra liquid reserved, which is fine in case for any reason we feel we need to thin this out a little. But yeah, that looks just like about two cups. And also, if you do have any liquid left over, don't throw that out. That's loaded with vitamins and minerals. Uh, be sure to 
either save that to use as a base for a soup or a stew, uh, or just a sipping liquid, put in a little, a little bit of uh, sea salt and uh, give yourself like a little mineral boost <laughs> for the day. So don't, uh, but don't throw it out. And something I have to share with you, uh, I was chatting with my mom, you know, she lived during the Great Depression as well as the rationing of uh, World War II and assorted problems in the 1970s with inflation and whatnot. But she would never throw out any water that she used in cooking. So if she had water left over from vegetables, she would drain, from cooking vegetables, she would drain that into a bowl. And she would use it, as I said, you know, either for a base for soups or stews. She'd use her potato water or her pasta water to feed uh, her sourdough starter, things like that. But uh, this Sunday when we were chatting over coffee, she was sharing with me how she and her mother, they had a big garden. Um, both during the Depression and during World War II. And so they would save their vegetable water to water their plants because it was kind of their version of kind of a little homemade fertilizer. So that's what they would just, if they boiled up some veggies, they would save the water and then go out and uh, water the garden. And they had a big garden. To, she said often during the Depression, a lot of times all they were eating was vegetables. So it got them through. Alrighty, well this is simmering nicely and I'm just going to go ahead and pour in our two cups of liquid. And as I do this, I'm going to keep whisking. That helps prevent the development of any lumps. So just keep whisking. Get all of your liquid into your saucepan and just keep whisking to prevent any lumps. And what you're going to want to do is turn up your heat and you want to bring this up to a boil but don't walk away from it. Keep your eye on it and keep whisking. And you'll notice that once it comes up to a boil, it'll thicken and then it's done. Turn off your heat. Well, I whisked out all the lumps and now I have a beautiful uh, consistency of our sauce here. And what I did was the way you can tell that your sauce is ready, just dip the back of your wooden spoon or any spoon that you have into your pan and if you can run your finger through and it stays separated like that then you'll know that your sauce is done. Now I tasted the sauce it's very mild so I'm going to go ahead and add in a teaspoon of salt which I think is good because this is a lot of uh, this is a pretty large uh, amount of casserole but you can certainly start with a half a teaspoon of salt if you want. Then I'm just going to give a couple of twists of black pepper. Again, you know, I'm not going to measure <laughs> anything specifically, but just a couple of good twists there and then another stir. And I've turned the heat off. Next, all you need to do is open your cans of tuna, drain them, and then just go ahead and put them into your bowl. Now, could you mix all of this right in your casserole dish? Certainly. But just so that you can see exactly what I'm doing, I'm just going to do this in a big bowl. And then you just kind of want to break up your tuna with clean hands. <laughs> I always like some of the uh, chefs, they always say that clean hands are some of our best tools in the kitchen. It's very true. But just flake that up so that it, the tuna is broken up into smaller pieces. Then we're just going to go ahead and dump our potato vegetable mixture right on top of our tuna. And you know, this is something that you could even do, right, like when you make your sauce, if you have the type of dish that can go into the oven, like a, a, uh, a larger saucepan, maybe like a cast iron, enameled cast iron one, those are very popular. Uh, you could probably do it all right on the stovetop and then pop it into the, oh, sorry, <laughs> pop it into the oven. Alrighty, now the next thing we're going to do is go ahead and put our sauce right onto our vegetable uh, tuna mixture. Let me start with this, just getting every little last bit of goodness. And I've reserved my um, vegetable water behind me. So if we feel it's too thick, we can always thin it a little bit. And once we get that beautiful sauce over our vegetables and tuna fish, we're just going to stir this around until it's well mixed. Now, we're going to be putting this into our 9 by 13 
baking dish. The recipe didn't mention to grease the baking dish, but sometimes, and again, this is the type of thing you have to look out for when you are uh, looking at older recipes, is that often many things were assumed by the recipe writer that home cooks would naturally know. And so uh, even though it doesn't say to grease the baking dish, just from experience, I think it's always a good idea uh, to, to grease your baking dishes before adding any contents to them. Now all we do is once we get this all beautifully mixed is go ahead and put this down into our baking dish. This looks really good. It reminds me so much of a chicken pot pie. Oh, I can't wait. We have to make the biscuit topping and then I look forward to really enjoying this. Well, I've got this in my baking dish. Now we're gonna set this aside and quickly make our biscuits. Now for the biscuits, this recipe calls for two cups of all-purpose flour. And this is just plain, regular all-purpose flour that I bought at the grocery store because I think that's most accessible for everyone. But if you're farther along on your traditional foods journey and you have an all-purpose spelt flour or you have an all-purpose einkorn flour, you could certainly use that in this recipe. And if you wanted to up the nutrition and make these a little bit more of a whole grain biscuit, I think that would work as well. Uh, when I've made biscuits, sometimes I've used 100% uh, whole grain flour. Uh, it, you don't get as high a rise, but it's still pretty good. Uh, what you could do here was maybe do half and half. I think that might create a really nice biscuit, yet one that had some whole grain flour incorporated into it. Now in this recipe, it says two cups sifted flour. So I'm just gonna run this through my mesh strainer. And then it says to that, as you're sifting, add three teaspoons of baking powder. Now that may seem like a little bit of a lot to us, and I'm not sure I'll have to research this, but I'm wondering if maybe baking powder over the years has changed a bit and the baking powder we use today may be a little more efficient or something, I'm not sure. But I'm just gonna go ahead and follow it as is and I'm gonna put in three teaspoons of baking powder. And I actually think that my baking powder is maybe a little more similar to uh, the older baking powders because the baking powder that I use is aluminum free. And I'm not sure when they may have started adding aluminum to baking powder, but I think that one of the reasons it may have been added, and you have to let me know in the comments if you know more about this, uh, was maybe to help it be a very good rising agent. But I'm, I have, this is my little uh, baking powder here, it's aluminum free. And so I think I'm gonna be in good shape using three teaspoons because I've noticed even when I follow a modern recipe and it says say one teaspoon of baking powder, I always add a little extra since I do use an aluminum free baking powder. So I'm gonna go ahead and dump my baking powder into here and then it calls for a half a teaspoon of salt. So I've got that right here in my little salt cellar and I'll go ahead and add in that half a teaspoon of salt. So just sift your flour and your baking powder and your salt all together down into your bowl. And if you see any little bits that don't sift through, you can just work them with your finger and then they should sift right through, no problem. Next, you're gonna to wanna to add in one tablespoon of dried parsley. And I could see how different times you make this, you could really jazz this up and change things up a bit with depending on what filling you put in your a base, you know, in the tuna base, and then what herbs and spices you might want to put into your flour for your biscuits. Now for the remaining ingredients for our biscuits, we're going to need six tablespoons of butter, and I've just got it cut up here, and it's chilled. The recipe doesn't specify that, but I think that the butter should be chilled. And then I've got a half a cup of milk, and then I've got a half a cup of cottage cheese. Now, if you want to learn how to make cottage cheese homemade, it's very easy to do and I'll be sure to link to that uh, video, and it also has a recipe with it, and I'll link to that in the description and in the pinned comment. Now, before we continue on with our biscuits, you wanna go ahead and you wanna preheat your oven to 425 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, I've stirred that dry parsley into my flour. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and dump in my cold butter. 
Now again about the butter, I want to mention that they also mention lard. So if you have lard, you can definitely use that here as well. And it says to just go ahead and cut in the butter of the lard into your flour. And basically what that means is if you have a pastry cutter, you can use that. Uh, I, I'm going to use two knives, sometimes two forks can work. But the bottom line is you just want to get it to looking where it's look like all little bits of crumbs. So just go ahead and continue to cut in that butter until it just starts to look like crumbs. And as I said, you can use a pastry cutter, knives, forks, whatever works for you. You can even use clean hands if you want. I just recommend running them under cold water first so they're not too warm when you put them into the mixture. Next, all we need to do is put our cottage cheese into our milk and just give it a good whisk. Okay, I've got that nicely incorporated. I've got some of the curd sticking it in my whisk here. Now all you want to do is make a well in the middle of your flour and then go ahead and pour in your milk and cottage cheese mixture. And then with your hand just start working your flour into the liquid. Now it doesn't take long to incorporate that liquid into our dough and it's just going to kind of be a crumbly kind of wet kind of little shaggy kind of dough. Now this is where the fun begins. I thought this was such a clever way to make biscuits and probably kind of quick and fast uh, for the home cook as well as no need to go or no need but no reason to go back and pull up your scraps again and then cut those out and then any scraps pull them up again you know and that the more you mess with it the the less uh, tender or good rise you get out of your biscuit dough. So this I thought was very clever, but you just want to, and you'll see what I'm talking about, you just want to put some flour on your board and then you're going to put your wet flour mixture. Don't worry that it's all crumbs like that. It's going to work out beautifully. Then all you're going to start doing is working this dough to bring it together into a log and then we're going to slice these. How clever is that? It reminds me of those biscuits that you see at the grocery store that you're in a can and you pop the can and then the biscuits are all in a row. It's kind of a similar concept, but homemade. So I just pulled the dough together, about five or six kneads to it, and then started rolling it out. And you want to get it into a log that's about 12 inches long. Next, the recipe says to cut this log into 16 equal pieces. So I'm going to eyeball it and just do the best I can. I'm going to start by cutting this down the middle and then, and I've got a nice sharp knife here. It doesn't recommend, I know biscuits tend to not like to be teared, so I'm not using a serrated knife and I'm just hoping that this knife is sharp enough. And what I'm going to do is then just proceed on and cut each half into half and so on and so forth until I've got the 16 uh, equal size biscuits. Well, I've got my 16 sliced biscuits and I want to share a tip with you. Now, this isn't in the recipe, but I think this would make uh, this job even easier is if you refrigerate these for a little bit after you roll, or, or at the whole log actually, after you roll the log out, I would pop it in the fridge for maybe 10 minutes or so. And I think it might be a little easier uh, to slice and also help you know keep everything nice and a little bit chilled. But in any event, I've got my 16 biscuits here and now all it says is to just go ahead and pop these right on top of your tuna mixture. So I've got my biscuits all on top of my tuna mixture. It didn't give any indication of what type of pattern or whatever to make, so I'm just kind of winging it. And it also doesn't say to brush them with butter, but I think they're just crying for a brush of butter. So what I'm gonna do is brush them with a little butter, and then I'm gonna sprinkle them with some salt. And I think it's just gonna add an extra little layer of flavor that's going to be delicious. Now don't worry if you don't have a pastry brush, you can do this with uh, the back of a spoon, works just as well. And I have to mention something that I thought was uh, a good question. My husband, as I'm making this, my husband just asked me, why did they add uh, cottage cheese? What is that in place of? And I thought that was a great question. And to be honest with you, I don't 100% know. 
If your mom's made uh, uh, biscuits with cottage cheese, let me know why they decided to choose that. I'm thinking that it's just something along the lines of buttermilk that will, uh, like with any type of uh, cultured dairy, uh, maybe it helps make them tender. <laughs> I'm not really sure. Well, at least my cottage cheese was cultured uh, because it was inoculated with uh, cultures after the fact. So I think that'll help the biscuits. But just a regular cooked cottage cheese, I'm not 100% sure. So that'd be something interesting to learn in the comments. So I pop that casserole into my 425 degree Fahrenheit preheated oven and we're going to cook that for about 15 to 18 minutes till the biscuits look nice and golden and well risen. Well, I just took this out of the oven and it looks glorious. Now, the original recipe said 15 to 18 minutes at 425 degrees. Mine took a full 20 minutes. So everybody's oven is a little different. So I set my timer for 15, then I realized that it wasn't ready, set it for 18, but I saw that it still needed a few more minutes to go. So that's a good way to keep an eye on it, you know, if you have a little kitchen timer or if it's built into your stove uh, so that nothing burns. But it did take a full 20 minutes to get the biscuits to look nice and golden. Well, this was really bubbling and piping hot when I took it out of the oven. So I let it just rest for a few minutes. Now we're gonna go in for the taste test. And I'm gonna get one of these biscuits and I'll slice the biscuit open so we can see how it turned out. But look at this gloriousness. This looks great. Ooh, so nice and creamy and luscious. Well, I got a little bit of everything on my spoon here. Let's give this a taste and we'll see how the mixture is and then we'll cut open that biscuit. Mmm. Mmm. Oh, that's tasty. I think you're gonna really enjoy this. And it does not at all have a strong tuna fish flavor. So that's kind of a plus if there are people uh, that you're feeding who may not be crazy about tuna fish. It, the flavor is actually kind of covered up. I highly recommend this. Alrighty, let's t crack open this biscuit and see how it is. Ooh, steam's coming out of it. They have almost like a cake-like texture, and I want, or at least from looking at them. And I wonder if that's from the cottage cheese, but I gotta be on the bottom. I guess that's okay. <laughs> well, let's give them a taste and we'll see how they came. Mmm. Oh, they're really flavorful. They came very nice and the texture's good. Kind of cake-like, a little different than biscuits that I'm used to. I'm often a little on the lazy side and I make the drop biscuits uh, rather than the rolled biscuits, but the texture is kind of almost similar to a drop biscuit. I highly recommend it. It's very tasty. I got some on my fingers here. But in any event, I hope you enjoyed making this with me. And if you'd like more Depression Era recipes and more old fashioned recipes in general, and ones that are easy to make, budget friendly, but nutritious and delicious, be sure to click on this playlist over here where I've got a whole host of recipes as well as desserts. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.